Hey, thank you guys. Really appreciate it. Um, welcome to Valley View. If you're a first-time guest, I would love to meet you. I'll be out in the lobby uh, after, uh, after our worship today. And uh, for those of you who are joining us online, we're glad that you've uh, tuned in to listen to us as well. If you'd take out the blue insert that's in your bulletin today, or you can access that outline on the U version. The back of the bulletin will tell you how to do that. And you can take some notes. Uh, in 2017, God wants to change your life. And I know that for sure, because every day of every year, God wants to change our lives. That's his whole business. He wants to make us more like Jesus. And I'm excited today because I'm going to share with you our theme for 2017, some of the plans that I know will be life-changing if you really want to move closer to Jesus. Uh, I pray that God will use 2017 to be an amazing year of spiritual growth in your life leading you to experience the fullness of everything God wants to do in you. And I pray that at the end of this year, you will know Jesus better than you know him right now, you'll, that you'll know him, uh, know him better, that you'll follow him more closely, that you'll love him more dearly, understand his will more clearly than you ever have before. Because this year, we're going to focus on the life and teachings of Jesus. Now, there's no question that God sent Jesus to this earth to be our example, to enable us to see in his life and to hear from his lips exactly what God wants us to be and to do. He was God's perfect model for humanity. And he wants us to follow his example so that we can share his life. Jesus' life, as you look at it, and we're going to this year, was one of joy and, and satisfaction, of peace contentment, power, and freedom, love, and, and, and grace, a, a life of insight, wisdom, a life of purpose, significance, integrity, wholeness, abundance, blessedness, on and on we could go. His life led him to live above the common life of the humanity around him. And that's what made him so appealing to, to, to other people. And that's what God wants for us. He wants real life. He wants us to have, Jesus said, I came that you might have life more abundantly. He wants us to live life to the full. There's no greater life than the life that Jesus lived. Any more, there's no more perfect humanity. There's no individual that ever lived up to human potential that God intended more than Jesus did. You know, on many occasions, Jesus told his disciples, come after me. Follow me. One occasion he said, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will become like his teacher. His apostle Peter. Tradition tells us that Peter was the author of the second gospel, that Mark wrote the gospel as Peter preached it. And, and, and Peter says, God called you to do good, even if it means suffering just as Christ suffered. For he is your example. And you must follow in his steps. We're to follow in his example, even if it means suffering, the Bible says. The Apostle John not only wrote the fourth biography of Jesus, but he also wrote three letters in the New Testament. And he said, those who claim to belong to him must live just as Jesus did. So he's our example. And as disciples of Christ, we know that we're to follow his example. And yet, how much time do we spend observing Jesus? How much time do we spend listening to Jesus, hearing his words? About 40 years ago, I was sitting in chapel at Ozark Christian College, and I was listening to a guy named Don DeWelt preach. And he challenged me as he talked about this very thing. The beginning of John's gospel says, no one has ever seen God, but the only and unique Son who is identical with God and is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. That last phrase there, has made Him known, is the Greek word for exegete. Jesus, that, that word means that Jesus explained God. That's what to exegete means. He explained God. He declared what God is like. He shows us God in all His glory. There's no way that we can know God unless we look at Jesus. Because no one can ever see God. 
The Holy Spirit says the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. And that means that the most important thing in life is to hear and see and follow Jesus, to learn from Him, to understand and see God in Him. And yet, as Don DeWell talked about that, I realized I was spending very little time in the life and teachings of Jesus, very little time really observing and listening to Him in the four Gospels. I was spending a lot more time in in some of the rest of the Bible. So how could I really follow Him if I wasn't tuned in to what He said, to what He did? And so beginning at that time, I began to read through the Gospels at least two times, two, two or three times every single year. And it made a huge difference in my life. And so in 2017, we're going to focus on the life and the teachings of Jesus. Now last year, many of you read through the entire Bible. I was just reading some of those Challenge 365 surveys. And uh, we're still collecting those, by the way. Uh, we have a, but you have to get them in today because tomorrow's our staff, staff retreat starts. But many mentioned what, what a blessing that was. How much you had grown in your love for God Uh, how how beneficial it was to be doing this together with other believers. And in those final two surveys, uh, the one that that I was just reading yesterday and today, you ask us to consider doing something similar this year. The primary negative response that we had, very few negative responses to Challenge 365, but if there was a primary negative response, it was this, it was too heavy. There was too much, six, seven chapters a day was too much reading. Uh, People got behind and they just couldn't get caught up. And so this year, as we read through the Gospels, we're reading only one chapter a day. Uh, As I shared last weekend, the first 24 weeks of 2017, we're going to go through the Gospels. We're going to concentrate on all that Jesus began to do and teach. Those are Luke's words. Since Jesus is our model, And since the purpose of God's Spirit in our life is to transform us into His image and into His character, we're going to focus on Jesus. We're going to spend time with Him, observing Him, listening to Him for the first 24 weeks, first half of this year roughly. But since Jesus' story is told in four Gospels, and a lot of those Gospels repeat the same teaching and the same uh, events, what we're going to do is we're going to read a harmony of the Gospels which is one harmonious account putting all four Gospels together. And we have a a reading schedule available today at the Move booth out in the lobby. You can also purchase this uh, this Gospel, this uh, Harmony of the Gospels, at our cost. It's $15, but we, we can get it for $11. And that way you can read the combined account. You don't have to... Uh, read the same story two or three times, hopping from Matthew to Luke to John to Mark uh, and and things like that. You can can just have everything in one spot. I've studied the Gospels this way ever since I heard Don DeWelt speak. So for over 40 years, I've been studying the Gospels in, in a harmony so I can see how they all fit together. You can also buy a Kindle version of this harmony if you'd like. It's, it's cheaper. I think it's three, three, three or four bucks if you'd like to do it that way. And, and then in the final 28 weeks of the year, we're going to focus on what Jesus continued to do and teach through his body, the church, after his resurrection. He came to live in his body. And, and so we're going to look at the story of the early church in the book of Acts and in the various New Testament letters, how they tie into that story. And, and it's going to be an amazing time this year. And it's going to take far less time than going through the whole Bible. So I'm hoping each of you will get involved with us spending this special time with Jesus in 2017. And in order to help you with your reading, we've got all kinds of resources uh, that that are available. The same things that we had in Challenge 365, plus we've got some new ones. Besides uh, reading uh, the reading schedule and the Harmony of the Gospels, uh, we've got all the reading available in an audio segment on our website. And you know, they just pr- were promoting the uh, church app. If you don't have my church app, you just push, I, I got it right on the front, I push that so it comes up to my church. And then at the top of that, I push move. And that opens up to move. And then I go down to move and I go to the reading plan. Push the reading plan and then I put listen online. Day one. And we have Dan Harder who is does voiceovers, that's his business, and he's taken the entire, 
this, this, this book is in the, uh, the, the Gospels are in the uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible version, and he has... See if you can hear. Since many have undertaken to compile a narrative about you hear who that is? That have been it's that simple. That simple. Lo download that app. It's free. And, uh, you know, but, you know, so it, some people just don't like to read. And that's a way you can listen to it. Every sermon this year will be from a portion of the scripture that you've read last week. And the reading schedule starts tomorrow, or really today. And uh, you can pick it up back there in both the printed version. You can get it on our website. You can get it on the app. Uh, you can sign up to get a daily text or an, or an email. And that's on the back of your connection card today. And it'll give you the reading for the day and the link to it. And we'll have classes on Sunday at 9 and 1030 and also on Wednesday nights that are following the reading schedule. So you can text or email all of those teachers, that the class you're going to attend, with your questions. But you can also go on to the amp or, or, or to, um, to the app or to our website and there's a question and answer and you can ask and our pastors will answer those questions within 72 hours and they'll be posted on the website uh, a lot of practical hands-on tools that we're going to have this year and so the reading schedule starts tomorrow and then next week I'm going to preach from a section uh, of that and then the classes and the studies will start next week as well so our theme is move and the idea, if there's anything God calls us to do, it's to move. In the Old Testament, as we saw in Challenge 365, it was the story uh, of God choosing a people and then moving them from idolatry to being his own special people. And then moving them, uh, preparing to, you know, moving them from slavery into a promised land of their own. And then preparing to move them from an old covenant of law into a new covenant of grace and love. The Apostle Paul reminds us that we're always moving. He says, remember that at that time, at one time, you were separate from Christ. You were excluded. Can we get that slide up there. You were excluded from the life of, of uh, from, the, from the, you were separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, he has moved you from where you were. You've been, where you were formerly far off, and you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. God is constantly calling us to move as he transforms our life. He moves us to be more like Jesus. Our life is a lifelong journey, moving from the mind of the flesh to the mind of Christ. Moving from darkness to light. Moving from bondage to freedom. Moving from sinfulness to holiness. We're always moving. We're always drawing nearer uh, to Christ, nearer to God who loves us. And this year, we're going to be moving close, closer to Jesus intentionally. Moving more into His Word. Moving into the world and into the community to live out the life of Jesus that we see in the Gospels and to be His body, to be His arms, His legs, His hands, His mouth in this world around us. The second half of the year, we're going to especially focus on our outreach as we watch the early church begin to move out into their world and turn that world upside down for Jesus. Speaking about the life and teachings of Jesus, let me share with you one verse where Jesus puts those two things together as a challenge to all of us who follow him. In Matthew chapter 7, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Therefore, who, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice... Why don't you circle that on your outline? Hears and puts into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Jesus said, you want a solid foundation for your life? You want something you can stand on when tough times come? My words are a solid foundation for your life. He who hears my words and puts them into practice. How do I hear what God has to say and then put it into practice so it makes a difference in my life? You know, a lot of people call the Bible the good book. You ever heard it called the good book? But I prefer to call it the guidebook. A good book, you can just leave anywhere, pick it up every once in a while. But a guidebook, you keep with you. Because it directs you. It guides you. Uh, God wants us to use His book, His Word, as a guidebook for our daily life. Many years ago, somebody d developed a very practical and memorable outline of how we can get the Word of God to be our guidebook. 
where we can actually live it out in our life. And they use the hand as the outline. The first one is the little finger. That's your weakest finger, right? And that's hearing the Word of God. You can hear God's Word taught many different venues. You can listen to audio Bibles. God says faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Every time you hear God's Word, it builds and strengthens your faith. And that's the good news. The bad news is that we tend to forget over 90% of what we hear within 72 hours. That's a bummer for preachers because that means you're going to forget everything by Wednesday that you've heard today. And that's exactly why the little finger, you know, hearing is not enough. If we're going to really build a solid foundation, that's just the beginning. It's just the start. The second step is I need to read God's Word, and that's what we're encouraging you to do. The Bible's the best-selling book in human history because it's such an incredible book. I mean, it's got action. It's got drama. It's got amazing love stories. There are some, uh, there are some inspiring stories in there of people who faced incredible odds and came out victorious and strong because of God's power to change lives and work miracles. This book is the cornerstone of our entire civilization. Nearly every legal system in the world traces its beginnings to the law that God gave through Moses. Through the centuries, this book has inspired uh, hundreds of revolutions and freedom movements that have changed the course of world history. Every day, I don't know if you thought of this, but every day, people who have never even read this book quote from it. Did you know that? They don't even know it because hundreds of common phrases are in our vocabulary that come from Scripture. A wolf in sheep's clothing, a drop in the bucket like a lamb led to slaughter, uh, uh, my brother's keeper, thorn in the flesh, eat, drink, and be merry, giving up the ghost, the handwriting is on the wall, the apple of my eye, no rest for the wicked, and, and hundreds more. Yet even with all that, the incredible thing is how little this book is actually read. Statistics tell us that 91% of Americans own a Bible. 80% of America, uh, let's see, the average home has three Bibles in it. The average home in America. 80% of Americans believe the Bible is the most important book ever written. And 58% think everything in the Bible is true. But very few have read it. Why? Maybe because they don't understand why God wants us to read it. It's the very reason that you want your children to listen to your guidelines and your directions. Because you want to help them. He wants to make you happy. Did you know that? The Bible says happy is, every, is the one who reads this book. He wants to bring joy into your life. The joy of living in the center of the Creator's plan for us. The joy of discovering what I call the sweet spot of life. Exactly where God wants you to be. He gave us this book so we could have a full and fruitful life and avoid many of the errors that so many people make and, and many of the problems. God shows us in, how important His Word is in Deuteronomy 17, he says he should keep it with him. Talking about the Bible. And all, all the time, he should keep it with him all the time and read from it every day of his life. Then he will learn to respect the Lord his God and he will obey all the teachings and commands. He gave that command to the king of Israel. Which tells me that the more responsibility you have or the busier your life gets, the more important it is that you read God's word. If you'll make a little investment, a few hours a week, to read this book, you'll find that the payoff is, is, is truly incredible. Let me give you three suggestions as you start reading the Bible. Number one, read it in a translation that uses 21st century English. There are some people that read the Bible in what's called the, the King James Ber Version. It was written in 1611, okay, translated in 16. It's great if you're 410 years old. But 1,395 words in the English language have changed since 1611, and you're not going to understand that book. So we're using the Holman Christian Standard Bible here, which is an excellent translation. The New Living Translation, the New Century Version, the, the 2011 New International Version. I don't like the one before it, but the 2011 one. Uh, God's Word Translation. There are a lot of them. But find one that's in the modern English. Secondly, read it systematically. Have a plan like the one we've got out in the booth in the, in the lobby. Uh, and you don't have to use that plan, though, but figure out a plan for yourself. And, and let me tell you this, you will be way more consistent reading the Bible if you find a specific time and a specific place that is best for you. I have a chair that I sit in. I have a time that I go to. 
and I just don't miss that time. First thing every morning between 3.45 and 4.15, I begin meeting with God, and I do it every day, seven days a week, a little later on the weekends. But you, you see what I'm getting at. If you, if you have a consistent time, you're going to be way more consistent in your reading. So I hear God's Word, I read God's Word, and then that third finger is I meditate on God's Word. See, you're getting a little bit better grip on the Bible, every, every finger you use. You know, that's not much of a grip on the Bible. You get a couple more, but, you know, as you get it, I, and I'm not talking about transcendental meditation. I'm not talking about sitting in a lotus position, humming a mantra, and trying to become one with the universe. The Bible, the Bible talks about meditation. And it, it means focusing your mind on Scripture, mulling it over in your mind, thinking about it, so that you can see how its truth fits your life. And there's several ways you can focus your thoughts on God's Word. Uh, one is to just get a mental image of the verse. Let's just take a famous verse, Psalm 23, 1. The Lord's my shepherd. Think about that. Maybe say it, giving emphasis to the Lord is my shepherd. The God who created everything is, is my shepherd. The God who made me is my shepherd. The one who has all power is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He's not just some God way out there, but he cares personally about me, every, every detail of my life. He's concerned about what's going on there. So he's imminent with me. And then the Lord is my shepherd. What's a shepherd do? He feeds me. He leads me. He guards me. He guides me. He directs me. He, he cares for me. He watches over me. And you begin to, to see, you, you can focus your thoughts also by asking questions. You know, what's this verse mean to me? Why did he say that? How, do, you know, how does that fit into the way I relate to my wife or to my husband or to my children? What, what does this mean about some struggles that I'm facing? How does this truth fit with the way I manage my time or manage my money or manage my business? Uh, there are a lot of different ways you can mull over, you can meditate on a verse, but let me tell you why it's important to think about, meditate on God's Word. Proverbs 4.23 says it very clearly. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. In other words, what you're thinking about today is what you're going to be tomorrow. And that's why meditation is so vital. What will happen when we meditate on the Word of God? Listen to Joshua 1.8. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. And Psalm 1 says about the same thing. They love the Lord's teaching. And they think about those teachings day and night. They're meditating on them. So they are like a strong, uh, so they are strong like a tree that's planted by a river. Everything they do will succeed. Isn't that amazing? When you meditate on God's Word, He promises that it's like planting yourself in rich soil where true spiritual success can come into your life. The same verse that tells us to meditate day and night says study this book of instruction continually. And so that's the next step. That's the fourth finger. You study God's Word. And as you do that, you're getting a lot better grip on what he says. Acts 17, 11 says the early Christians were very glad to receive Paul's message. They studied the Scriptures carefully every day. Studying means digging deep into the Bible. Really understanding what it means. You take notes. You compare other passages. I underline and highlight and have notes all over the margins of my Bible. Every once in a while, somebody will say, you know, you, know, you, you shouldn't write in that. That's a holy book. Listen, the words are holy. Can you imagine a football player after a football game coming up to coach and saying, hey, coach, do you like how clean I kept my uniform? What would a coach think about that? What's the purpose of a uniform, huh, if you're, if you're an NFL football player? Well, the same thing is true. God gave us the Bible so we can use it, so we can study it, so we can dig into it, so we have to buy other ones because the pages are falling out. You see what I mean? So it can perform its work in us who believe. I don't study it just to know more, but to build a foundation for my life, to gain God's perspective on things, to have the mind of Christ, to find the answers I need, to, to, to find the hope that I need, the peace that I need, to find the joy and the comfort that I need, and to have the power that I need for daily living in this world. 
More than anything else, this book has given us to help us develop a relationship, a meaningful relationship with God. You see, it's not a cold list of just of, of rules and regulations. It's God's invitation to us to have a relationship with Him so that we can have the guidance of a Father who just happens to be the one who created us and this entire universe, who knows exactly what we need to reach our potential to best function, to really enjoy this life that He's given us and created for us. When you study the Bible, it's like sitting down with God, saying, you know, and God saying, let me help you with this problem that you're having with the kids. Let me show you how to handle this, this issue, this crisis. Or God is saying, you know, I know you feel like there's no hope right now, but let me just show you what I can do. That, that's what the Bible is about. It's God opening His heart, opening His mind, to us, building a relationship with us. In fact, it's so far from being a list of, of rules, cold list of rules and regulations. You know, there are guidelines in there, certainly. It's God's love letter explaining what He wants to set us free to become if we'll simply let it. Just like a parent. It's our Father who's sharing with us how we can have the best life we could possibly have. In His relationship with us, He wants us to, to build it on a, a, a lasting foundation. So I hear the Word, I read it, I meditate on it, I study it, and next, I memorize it. Now, I know that's a bad word for some people. But listen, you, and I've had people, I remember, uh, Joy Van Vliet's not here, but... Uh, Ray's here, I think. His mother took a class I taught years and years ago, probably 35 years ago, Ray. And uh, I was only seven. And, uh, <laughs> and anyway, she, she said, oh, I can't memorize. And she, you know what? She did better than anybody else in that class memorizing. Because you may think you can't memorize, but the truth is there's one category of things you can memorize. At the count of three, I would like all of you to state out loud your telephone number. One, two, three. 303-929-8413. 303 you knew it, didn't you? Now, I know some of you guys probably had to ask, ask your wife. <laughs> some of us aren't really too bright, you know. Some of us, I took the short bus to school and was in the slow class. But I, even I know my... I, even I know my phone number. S same way with your address. One, two, three. Nine, eight, four, nine, Bathurst Way. You do the same thing with the Social Security number. We, we, here's, here's the things we memorize. Something that matters to us. You know, that's important to us. And something that we have to repeat or go over often. Do you know what? I'll turn on the radio sometimes. Or I, I have my favorite tunes on my on my phone that I can use when I'm skiing or when I'm mountain biking. And my favorite group is Credence. And I can remember songs from 1968 and I can sing them word for word and I never tried to memorize one of them. Because you repeat them, you repeat them, you repeat them. The Bible says, guard my words as your most precious possession. Write them down and also keep them deep within your heart. The psalmist said, I've hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. We can memorize Scripture because it's important to us. And then we just force ourselves to keep on repeating it. You keep, you, when you keep and hide God's Word in your heart, it will keep you from sin. And uh, if you, have you ever noticed that temptation doesn't come at convenient times? You know, the, the devil doesn't wait until you got your Bible with you so you can look up a verse to fight the temptation. And if you hide God's Word in your heart, it helps you when you battle temptation. And the more verses you memorize, the more the Holy Spirit can bring to mind when you're facing a decision or going through a temptation, especially if you memorize Scripture that speaks specifically to the temptations that you struggle with. See, there's the key to memorizing. Always pick a verse that matters to you that really speaks to you. As you're going through the Bible, you just mark them. You know, put a star by them. But those verses that speak to your heart, you want to memorize. And that's why 
memorization systems don't work, but th it works when you just memorize verses. And then you find a method that works for you. But I, your method always has to include repetition. That is absolutely essential. This morning, I repeat, I'm working on Philippians 4.12, and I wrote it out twice, all screwed up, and I, I kept on writing it, and I kept on speaking it. And then I, I keep that verse right underneath my speedometer and on the car, and that way I can't see the speedometer. No. <laughs> but officer, I was reading, I was memorizing scripture. <laughs> no, it, it's, 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 it's right below the speedometer. But I can, and so I can work on memorizing that. But it takes repetition. And, uh, you know, so how do you get a solid grip on the Word of God? So it really makes a difference in your life. You, you know, you've got the whole thing there. You hear it, you read it, you meditate on it, you study, you memorize, and then you apply it. Constantly applying. That's the palm. You do it. You live it out. James mentions the greatest danger to Bible reading Bible study, he says, don't fool yourselves into just listening to the Lord. Instead, uh, put it into practice. You know what? That's, that's, a, that's an error. It doesn't say listen. It says listening to the Word. Don't fool yourselves into just listening to the Word. Instead, put it into practice. We can fool ourselves into thinking we're growing spiritually when all we're doing is growing mentally in our knowledge of God's Word. James saying, don't fool yourself. This book was not given so much for our information as it was for our transformation. God is not looking for smarter sinners. He's looking for sincere saints, people who hear and do the will of God. Now let's say you work out at the gym every morning. So I come over tomorrow morning because I, I want to I check this out. And I, I bring my lawn chair and my bag of donuts and I open it up and I watch you in the weight room and I learn all kinds of new words, lat pull downs and bicep curls and squats and tricep push downs and bench press. And, 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 and when you finish, I take my last drink of my white chocolate mocha and I say, wow, that was a great workout. And you'd wonder what's wrong with this guy, wouldn't you? I've got to do it myself. What's the benefit of watching somebody else work out? And the same is true with the Word of God. Many times you can fool yourself by knowing it so well that you content yourself with that and you don't do any of it. And maybe this morning, you've been listening to me. I'll listen to a teacher and sometimes I'll say, wow, that's right. That's something, when I listened to Don Duell, I thought, you know, that makes sense. I need to do that. But a lot of times we content ourselves with staying right there and don't do anything about it. Mental agreement takes the place of action. The question is, what will you do about what we've talked about today? Will you, will you be, as James says, a forgetful hearer? Or will you be an effectual doer? 2017 can be an amazing year of spiritual growth in your life. You can get closer to Jesus. You can really grow in your love relationship to Him if you'll take advantage of this opportunity and move in 2017 into His Word and into His life. Take a few seconds to tear off that connection card and sign up uh, to, to join us together to read His Word this year. Uh, join us as we hear the Word, as we read the Word, as we meditate on it, study it, memorize it, apply it into our lives as we do it. You know, Jesus said, this is a very important verse, Jesus said. Can we have that verse back up on the screen? Now that you know these things, you will be blessed. That's not the verse, is it? If you do them. The blessing comes when the Word is lived out in our lives. So the next step, if, if you want to check it, is I, I, I want to accept the challenge to move in 2017 closer to Jesus by moving into His Word. But there's also a second one on there. Maybe you don't want to do what we're doing. I don't really care whether you do what we're doing or not. What I care is that you make a commitment to be in the Word. Maybe you have something else that you do as far as Bible study. Then get into that. But be in the Word. Draw nearer to Jesus. You can also sign up on the back of that, I'm interested in, for email readings or text, you know, te uh, email reminders or text uh, reminders of the reading each week. And uh, you can go to stop at the booth in the lobby, go over to the bookstore and see about picking up the, the Simplified Harmony of the Gospels. And if you would, pass those uh, connection cards into the worship hosts uh, or put them in the wall slots. The worship hosts will come as we sing this closing song. Or you can put them in the wall slots by the back doors. God bless you guys.